following case entitled Combined Reconstructive and Deconstructive Endovascular Approach for Bilateral Vertebral Artery Dissection with Subarachnoid Hemorrhage comes from the work done at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. No disclosures for this talk. A 42-year-old man presented after reportedly crying out in pain and collapsing near his bed. Initial examination was consistent with Hunt has 4 and he was intubated shortly after arrival. CT scan demonstrated diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage and hydrocephalus. A ventriculostomy was placed. Diagnostic angiography was then undertaken. Left vertebral artery injection demonstrated a dissecting pseudoaneurysm of the intracranial left vertebral artery immediately distal to the origin of the left pica. Three D reconstructions demonstrated significant inflow and outflow stenosis. Right vertebral artery injection demonstrated slow anterograde filling of the basilar artery. A distal extracranial right vertebral artery dissection was noted with flow limiting stenosis. Given the significant caliber of the extracranial right vertebral artery proximal to the stenosis, the right vertebral artery was felt to be the dominant contributor to the basilar artery. Additionally, this suggested that the stenosis was acute. Injection of the right thyrocervical trunk demonstrated significant collateral filling of the intracranial right vertebral artery. In summary, we have a middle-aged man presenting with subarachnoid hemorrhage. He has bilateral vertebral artery dissections. On the left side, he has a dissecting pseudoaneurysm of the left B4 segment immediately distal to the left pica origin. On the right side, he has critical flow-limiting stenosis of the right B3 segment. To address the ischemic impact of the critical flow-limiting stenosis in the right vertebral artery, a reconstructive approach with stenting and angioplasty was pursued. Following right vertebral artery reconstruction, the ruptured dissecting pseudoaneurysm of the left V4 segment was tackled with a deconstructive approach. In preparation for treatment, the patient was anticoagulated with heparin and given both abciximab and ticagrelor. Treatment occurred during the same initial diagnostic angiography session. Endovascular access was achieved through a triaxial support setup. Right vertebral artery reconstruction was addressed first. A pipeline embolization device measuring 5 mm by 25 mm was successfully deployed across the stenotic segment. The pipeline embolization device was chosen specifically for its high navigability, its available sizing, and ability to be resheathed. Right vertebral artery injection following pipeline deployment demonstrated persistent but improved stenosis. Angioplasty was subsequently done with a hyperglide balloon. This significantly improved filling through the right vertebral artery. Attention was then turned towards the left side. A headway microcatheter was used to access the pseudoaneurysm. Coil embolization was then performed. During coiling, the microcatheter was kicked out of the pseudoaneurysm. Given the close proximity of the left pica origin and the significantly slow distal filling, coiling was stopped. Contrast washout from a reconstructed right vertebral artery was noted distal to the coiled pseudoaneurysm. In this case, alternatives to left vertebral artery sacrifice include stent coiling, flow diversion, and microsurgical bypass. The first two options were not felt to be viable given the tight inflow and outflow stenosis relative to the pseudoaneurysm. The patient did well postoperatively, and his level of consciousness significantly improved. 
He was extubated on post-operative day one and was maintained on daily aspirin and twice daily ticagrelor. This case also highlights the serious challenge of dual antiplatelet therapy in a patient with hemorrhage and a ventriculostomy. After tolerating a three-day ventriculostomy clamp, the patient's ventriculostomy was removed on postoperative day 18. This was done after holding the patient's ficragrelor the evening and morning before the removal. A CT head was repeated after the removal and demonstrated, fortunately, no concerns for intracerebral hemorrhage. The ticagrelor was then restarted in the evening. The patient was then discharged home shortly thereafter. At one month since discharge, the patient has made a complete remarkable recovery and has returned to all his normal activities. He is scheduled for six-month angiographic follow-up. In summary, this case of bilateral vertebral artery dissection was managed in a single endovascular session, incorporating both reconstructive and deconstructive techniques. Deconstructive and reconstructive techniques offer different trade-offs that can be complementary as described in this case of bilateral vertebral artery dissection. In general, deconstructive techniques are useful for immediate exclusion of hemorrhagic pathology and are well established in the literature for management of unilateral vertebral artery dissection. Challenges of deconstruction include management of branching vessels such as pica, possible ischemic sequelae, and consideration of hemodynamic changes. Interestingly, some authors have described delayed de novo dissection of a vertebral artery after proximal occlusion or trapping of the contralateral vertebral artery, presumably due to increased hemodynamic stress. Reconstructive techniques with stenting offer an elegant solution for stenotic dissection flaps resulting in ischemia. Branching vessels can be spared, sacrificed, and hemodynamics may be improved. Challenges, however, include the technical need to cross the diseased segment, need for antiplatelet agents, particularly in the setting of concurrent hemorrhagic pathology, and the delayed process of vessel healing over the stent. The neurovascular surgeon must consider carefully the different profiles of these strategies and carefully apply them as appropriate to the patient. Zhao et al. reported in 2015 a similar combined strategy to address bilateral vertebral artery dissections. In their series of four patients, less thrombogenic stents were utilized, specifically Neuroform, Enterprise, and Solitaire AB stents. Key issues highlighted by this case include recognition of acute versus subacute dissection, stenting in the acute ruptured setting, and challenges in loading and maintaining antiplatelet agents, particularly in a patient in the ICU. Alternative approaches include use of alternative stents, reconstruction rather than sacrifice of the ruptured pseudoaneurysm, and a staged approach to treatment. Thank you.